Good evening and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Tonight we continue on with verse number 92, which reads as follows. Ye sang sanichayo nati, ye parinyata bhojana, sunyato animito ja vimoko ye sang gocharo, akase wa sakunan sakuntanang katite sang duranay ya. Which means, for whom there is no storing, no hoarding, for whom there is no hoarding. Ye parinyata bojanang, one who is uh, fully aware or fully mindful, has perfect understanding in regards to food. Hmm. Sunyato amito animito cha vimoko ye sangocharo empty and signless is there is the liberation no the empty and the signless liberations are they are their pasture are their habitat are their dwelling place pasture is really the meaning Akase wa sakuntanang Just as for just as for birds in the sky Gati te sang duranaya Their going, their destination is hard to know As so it regards to food, the point here is those people who don't hoard and are conscientious in regards to food, fully conscientious, parinyata. Parinyata means to know thoroughly. And you'd think, well, knowing, so, knowing food thoroughly, it's not all that, doesn't sound all that impressive. Until you really consider how important food is, what a role it plays in our lives, it's really the one thing that along with water water and air I guess but food is like the one thing that we really have to look for and work for you know, water theoretically is pretty easy to find air is still quite easy to find but food is something you actually have to work at so it is really the one thing um, that we should be that we have to be concerned with. So it's, it's about the most primal or basic requisite. And so it stands to reason that it's the one that is closest to our heart and most closely associated with things like craving and aversion. Our likes and dislikes of food are, well, they're, they're a bit of, a, of a, an issue. We obsess about food. It's the one thing that we have to think about, usually three, at least three times a day, usually more. You know, we'll have the three meals a day that we are thinking about, and then on top of that there are snacks, and there's treats, and, and, then, and then there's the cooking, and the preparing, and the uh, purchasing, and the storing, thinking about the food that's in, what's in our refrigerator, what's in our freezer, what's in the oven, what foods we like and dislike, thinking about nutrition, it's really a huge subject, right? Now we have all sorts of sorts of information about food, and you, if you look in the news, it is one of the topics that it comes up quite often. You know, this food is found to be bad for you, that food is found to be good for you. This whole gluten-free thing that people, some people say is just a big um, sort of uh, noxibo or, yeah. It, it doesn't really hurt most people, and then other people say it does. And you No, know, it's a big deal. Food is actually a big deal, which is kind of funny, because I don't think many people think of it like that. I think for the most part we think, well, food is just food. It's not a big deal. It's not something that a, a spiritual person should really concern themselves with. In fact, we would go the other way, I think. I think a lot of spiritual people become more obsessed with food, right? Worried because um, they want to be... They're concerned about themselves, and 
somehow we equate um, physical health with mental health, right? In Buddhism, I don't think that's the case. I think physical health is not not considered to be necessarily associated with mental health, especially in regards to food. Things like food, or even um, sickness, like uh, uh, well, any kind of sickness, a cold, a flu, or a terminal illness like cancer or so on. It's, um, I mean, you'd have to say that you'd have to say in that case there is some fairly with sickness there is a clearer picture because a clearer association because for most people when you're sick it uh, disturbs your mind more than when you're healthy but you could argue the other way and say um, healthy people have a dis have a disturbed mind in a different way because they become intoxicated with their body they become conceited about it but with food, I think there's even um, less of an argument that can be made that of a clear indication or a clear relationship between direct relationship between one's uh, nourishment and one's mental health, because overnourishment can lead to this intoxication. The Buddha said, uh, "Mandanaya." Madaya, no madaya, I think is the one. Madaya, mada, it, it makes you intoxicated. So, um, and 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 much more simpler than that, much more basic than that. Uh, food is an obsession, right? Good food, wanting good food, being disgusted by unpleasant food, um, having likes and dislikes and preferences. And, uh, and an obsession about health can actually be a, a huge hindrance for the mind. Worry and concern and, and, and distraction. So you're no longer mindful. I think to some extent we, 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 over, we obsess about it. So knowledge about food in Buddhism isn't like that. It isn't knowledge of what is nutritious and so on. That's not what is meant here at all. I'm getting ahead of... I haven't told the story yet, so I should probably do that before I talk too much about that. But this is a verse about food. It's the, the, third, the second and third lines are, are not about food, but the core here is talking about a person who understands food. So how it, what the story was, it's an interesting story, very short. But uh, the preceptor, Ananda's preceptor, uh, Bella... Bella Sisa, I think. Belata Sisa? Belata Sisa. He was, I think, an Arahant. I'm pretty sure. And it, that's what makes this story interesting, is he was an Arahant, and see, in the beginning, in the in the beginning, beginning times, the Buddha didn't have rules for the monks. It was just assumed that they would live properly because they were all enlightened. People would practice, would listen to the Buddha's teaching, become enlightened, he'd ordain them as monks. That's kind of how it went. But eventually, um, problems arose, and situations arose be mostly, based on, mostly based on monks that were not enlightened. So it wasn't that they should become enlightened first and then ordain, it's just that there were no un unenlightened monks uh, in the beginning. But eventually, that changed. <coughs> Excuse me. And one monk uh, being pestered by his, his wife to... He had been married before he ordained, and his wife came and pestered him to give her a child. Actually to disrobe, but then when he wouldn't disrobe, she pestered him to give her a child. And so he had sex with her, just to get rid of her, basically. And she left, and that was that. But... Uh, yeah, the Buddha didn't uh, really take kindly to that and and instated the first rule that monks shall not have sex. And it went from there. And in the end, we got lots and lots of rules. So, But this was in a time when there weren't as many rules as... It, it, the wor rules weren't all there yet. So we have this Arahant who was living off in the forest, or up on a mountain maybe, 
and he would go into to, um, into the food for alms and get enough for himself to eat, but then he would continue on alms, or he would go put that food, or go eat that food maybe, and then go on a second alms on a different street. And he would take that food that he got, just rice basically, and he would dry it in the sun, and then go and meditate. And he would enter into meditation for days. So he would be in, it said he was in meditation for a few days, I think. And then when he'd come out of, when he came out of, yeah, actually I don't know. No, it doesn't say that. The, the Dhammapada story says it, but in the Vinaya it doesn't say it. It just says he would he would dry it and leave it, put it aside. And then the next day he would put some put it in some water and eat it. But his point his his reasoning being he wouldn't have to go back into the village and he'd be able to focus on his meditation. It was really out of just a desire not to um, get caught up in in the village life and to focus on his meditation, just to stay in the forest and live in meditation. So somehow he thought this was a good idea. But it got back to the Buddha, and the Buddha actually scolded him, scolded an arahant, vigarahati, vigarahati, which means to abuse. It can mean it's really scolding. The Buddha gave him. But actually, that's what the, that's what it says. The Buddha did for everybody who who broke a rule or who 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 did something that was the instigation of a rule. But this is, I think, one of the only examples of an arahant being the reason for the creating of a rule. The Buddha did, I think, mention that it, he 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 was he understood that Belatasisa was was blameless, and in fact, he never. It's not an offense because there was no offense to break. And until the Buddha instated the offense, he said uh, before that it wasn't actually an offense. So anyone who broke it before that wasn't breaking, it wasn't doing anything. Well, could still say they're doing something wrong, but it wasn't an offense. So that was the... That was the story behind it. But it says in the yeah, it says in the Dhammapada, Apichatang Nisaya Katata. He was doing it um, out of his out of a desire for fewness of wishes or out of fewness of wishes. So he was a person who had little greed and little attachment. But it's a very dangerous precedent because then it leads to monks hoarding, you know. Let's have stores of food so that if I get something good today I can also have it again tomorrow. If I get something good today and tomorrow I get something bad, well I can eat yesterday's food today. So that we can store up sweets and uh, salts and spices and put salt on our food when we when it's not salty and if it's too bland, you know, we can put spices in it and so on. If I get something sweet today, it's funny being a monk because some days you get just so much food. Like today I went to Stony Creek and there was so much food. But you can only eat so much and then that's it and the next day you still have nothing. Which is important. It's an important part of the training to not um, To not cling, to be to be content with whatever, to not have this hanging over you, this um, sort of this sense of the past, sense of of what you're going to eat in the future, what you've stored up in the past, and thinking about what you've stored up and concern about it, and so on. It's liberating and it's challenging. Right? So it's 
liberating in the sense that you don't have to think about cooking or or um, storing, protecting. You don't have to worry about food going bad or being spoiled. But it's challenging because that's exactly it. You One day you might not get... Um, what you want well quite often you you do, it's not about what you want to eat it's about what you get so i remember uh there was a period of time in in chom tong where all i would get was sweets i was just going into the market and i couldn't figure out what i was doing wrong but all i would get was you know some few sweets to eat and that was all i ate for the day of course they were rice sweets so there was a little bit of substance to them but nothing real Certainly not nothing like vegetables, protein. So it was a matter of picking through the sweets and figuring out which ones were most most nutritious. But uh, then other days, you know, you just get so much food. But it's a it's a it, it's a complacency thing as well, right? If you've got lots of food, then you you tell you begin to re you rely upon it you know you take this as a refuge and it tell it it blinds you or it hides from the from you the fact that 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 this is ever present this is an ever present gnawing on us when you give up this um s support of having constant supply of food it forces you to let go forces you not to cling, it forces you to be open to, well, starving, at least going without food for a day. And it's funny how you, you get to see how the mind works then, because you know, there are people who actually purposefully fast for days on end, and, and they're fine with it. But when, it, when it's kind of forced upon you, right? I don't want to, you know, I was looking for food today and I didn't get any how your mind whines and complains, right? Because you feel that something's wrong. It's a sense of not getting what you want. Whereas some people are so happy to not eat, they do it for days on end, they'll fast and just drink fruit juice or something. It's a real test, it shows you your defilements. Not storing food is an awesome practice to, to, to keep. And, you know, I've been with monks who you can see where they start to give up the training and, and they've got like biscuits that they keep and bread stuffs that they keep aside for the next day to have in the morning with their coffee which they're also storing and so I remember uh, remember in Jamtong during this time where things were you know I wasn't getting quite the food that I w would assume to be uh, proper nutrition and I was struggling with it, but you know, being mindful and just really working through this. And then I, there was a lay person living out behind the uh, monastery, and I went to see him for something. He was one of the teachers at the time, and uh, he invited me in for, for toast, whole grain, whole grain toast, and peanut butter, and a bowl of cereal and <laughs> milk. And it just, it was just such a shock, like. It's quite a different practice, I guess. Um, you know, it's a real other level to your practice, having to you know, not having a fridge to store milk in and that kind of thing. So definitely worth practicing. Definitely worth undertaking. That's a part. I mean, there's so many aspects of the monastic life that are, for that reason, beneficial. Anyway, so that was sort of the the reasoning behind the rule. I assume that the Buddha. It's my, my understanding of his reasoning for instating the rule. And then he gives this verse on, on the importance of it, how, how, how supportive it is, actually, of freedom. So then he says, Sunyato animito cha mimoko ye sangocharo. Such a person, I mean, it's, it's such a powerful practice. And the Buddha says this several times. He talks about mindfulness. Ness. He doesn't use the word mindfulness. He uses parinyata or matanyuta, um, understanding, knowing moderation in food. But here he says, under fully understanding food. 
there's something else to to this that I'm also not saying. And bojana can mean not just physical food, but it can also refer to uh, mental food, right? So this would be sense impressions, sensual pleasures, and and uh, sen and suffering, you know, pain and and those things that give rise to likes and dislikes. That's a kind of a food as well. Vedana is a kind of food of feelings, of pleasant and painful feelings. Uh, thoughts, I think. You know, intentions are a kind of food because they create, uh, um, they create a result. They feed the future. So it's understanding that as well. But even just understanding physical gross food is uh, important because it's the basic one of the basic requisites. And the Buddha says this kind of understanding, but I would say if you're going to get into its relationship between Nibbāna, you probably have to go a little bit deeper and say, yeah, this relates to anything, because the word food in Pali, ahara, means that which brings. Hara is to carry, ahara means to bring. Um, so it brings about a result. Like food, physical food, brings about the body, right? Keeps, sustains the body. So it brings nourishment to the body, it nourishes. Feelings nourish, um, you know, attachments, likes and dislikes. Uh, consciousness nourishes experience. So there's four types of food. There's physical food, there's feelings, and there's consciousness, and then there's intentions. So intentions nourish results. Four types of food. And understanding them is considered, all four of them is considered a primary um, or a base for the understanding of reality. So when you understand all four, if you understand the mind and you understand karma, intentions, how they work, you understand feeling, you understand the physical aspects of experience. This leads to vimoka, vimoka which is freedom. So this is talking about nibbana. Sunyato means signless. This is through seeing non-self. So it helps you let go of the idea of self when you give up food, give up the... Um, obsession with pleasing and caring and tending for oneself. You know, often it's you're better off being from time to time malnourished because it tests you, it challenges you, it opens your mind up, it forces you to let go of this intoxication. I have a beautiful body, I have a strong body. It's funny, people always tell me I'm getting thinner. And, and I've been getting this for years that, oh, you're thinner than last time. And I have people who tell me this every year that I'm getting thinner. Um, I just think of that because the, 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 the way the body looks is interesting how we, we tend to uh, apply judgments to the body, saying it's like this, it's thin, it's fat. You know. we, uh, we're concerned about these sorts of things. And so we're, we become obsessed with food because we're worried about our bodies. And I would say to some extent the obsession, um, like for example people who are concerned with their weight and wish they were thinner, hmm? um, I think that kind of obsession actually makes it worse. It, it, it aggravates the situation, makes one more obsessed with food, and as a result makes it harder to uh, eat the right food because you you... You repress, 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 and then you indulge, as opposed to just understanding and saying, "Oh yeah, I'm only, I'm only need so much food, and as far as my needs go, I really don't need to eat so much." And you just stop. When you understand food, actually, food is um, is a big, big distraction, right? It's actually huge suffering in our lives, and we don't realize it. So that's a big part of parinyata, understanding that you know it's a huge bother. If uh, meditators will get like this. After a while, they'll sort of say, man, I've got to go eat again. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if I didn't have to go and eat? What a, uh, what a big, what a bother that is. So, so um, you know, this kind of understanding helps us give up self, helps us see impermanence. When you don't store, that's a big one. Animita means signless, so having no... Um, 
no, what is it called? Fr uh, no foreknowledge? Or so not, no no pre prior knowledge, not knowing in, in advance, having no warning. Right, because normally when we when we're storing, nimitta means we have a we have in our mind a, a sense, something tells us that tomorrow we're going to have pizza because there's pizza in the freezer, so we're able to know in advance. That's what nimitta means. Animitta means not being able to know in advance. It's signless. Means it it it's, it comes without ex with, comes unexpectedly, without warning. And so that's how this is. When you stop storing food, then it is. You can't have any expectations. You can't say, tomorrow I want to have pizza. You can, but you'll probably suffer because you'll probably not get pizza. Odds are. So it helps with seeing impermanence as well. And so such people, the Buddha says, this helps us, and along with all kinds of understanding about food, help us to dwell in this kind of freedom. Just as a bird... And then he uses this wonderful imagery of just as a bird that flies in the sky without leaving a trail. So too, it's hard to know the destination of someone. The meaning here is when they pass away. When they pass away, at the very, at the very worst, they will go to a pure abode. So they may go to heaven or they might go to the pure abodes where anagamis go to. Or they might not return at all. So much harder to know where they're they're headed, because it's harder to know their their minds. Their minds are so deep and so profound in their um, self, in, in their no, in their um, possession, no, their calm and their quietude. That it's hard to know where they're headed. And when they die, it's hard to know where they've gone. That's the meaning there. So, useful for us, well, useful for us to be mindful of food. You know, something that we don't talk about nearly enough, I think. My teacher was always going on about it. Of course, I think it had a lot to do with monks storing up and eating food at the wrong times and that kind of thing. So he was always bringing it up without really saying, hey, I know you guys are eating at the wrong times and storing up food, without actually accusing anyone, he would just bring it up like this. But nonetheless, it is a big deal, because food is primary. We don't pay enough attention to it. That's why eating meditation is very important. I mean, it's important. It uh, should be a part of our practice. And then the, the idea that it helps with seeing non-self, you know, because you can't attach to anything because you have to stop worrying about yourself or being obsessed with getting the right nutrition that kind of thing and animitta it, it shows you impermanence because you have to be flexible and such a person once they, they, they reach this they become free and when they're free you can't you get no sense of what kind of a person they are because they are simple they're just free I mean, I guess you do get a sense. You do get a sense that they're very deep, and that there's some depth to them. Anyway, so right, so useful to us, and that's where we're headed. We're headed in that direction to see impermanence, to see non-self, to give up suffering, to give up the cause, to stop clinging, and the idea that. In the end, we don't leave a trace. I think is it's useful for us for those people always wondering, how do I know? Uh, how do I know that I'm progressing? Well, the less of a trace you leave, you leave this, this, um, you know, just like the wind of the wings of a bird. That's the sort of trace that you leave. So you do affect people, but it doesn't bother them. You don't cause uh, conflict or friction. You just buff it with your wings something very light and undisturbing. <laughs> okay, so that's our Dhammapada verse for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in, and keep practicing, be well. Wishing you all peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering.